So now I want to discuss epidemiology's role in public policy. And you could almost ask, well, why didn't I discuss this in the beginning of this course? And the answer to that is I wanted to give you a general understanding and introduction to the different types of epidemiologic study designs, what the purposes of those designs are, and what we can yield from those designs before I then dive into discussing epidemiology's role in public policy. So just to refresh, epidemiology is the study of causes and distributions of diseases in human populations. But generally, what is the purpose of those studies? Well, it is fundamentally to study the etiology of a specific disease or problem, right? We are interested in understanding what causes the disease that we're studying. That's etiology. Now there was a paper by a man named Galea who looked at publications in four leading epidemiologic journals in 2012 and he found that 85% of those publications were concerned with the etiology of a disease with little attention on how etiology may be relevant for the intervention. So in that particular paper, which I strongly recommend you read, and it's included in the Blackboard readings, Galea argues that if epidemiologists actually advance the understanding of causes in population health and leave interventions to others, that that's basically a bad approach. And the focus on causality of disease at the expense of pragmatism, he argues, has led to a marginalization of the field of epidemiology. In general, he argues that epidemiologists have focused way too much on causality and not enough on, on implementation of programs to affect public health. And he has some points, definitely has some good points. The question, though, is it is it totally epidemiology's fault or are there other factors at play that prohibit epidemiology from truly impacting public health? In a paper in 1993, so it's dated now, epidemiologists by the name of Bracken stated that if Jon Snow wanted to remove the pump handle today, that he would need to network with community leaders, he'd have to interface with government agencies, He'd have to write an environmental impact statement, and he'd also have to obtain Human Subjects Committee approval. Now, obviously, this statement is a bit far-fetched and also rather cynical, but the whole point of this paper is that today's system, governmental system especially, is so complex that in order to affect change or implement change, it requires that you go through multiple, multiple steps and you have to essentially influence multiple people. So essentially the undertaking of epidemiologic research today has uh, become a huge burden. And why? Well, along with the fact that it's difficult to implement change, we all know that just getting funding to even study the implementation or the intervention itself is a challenge. That in general, there's not a big focus on NIH funding toward uh, public health programs or public health uh, interventions. Instead, the funding is greatly focused in on basic research and basic science. Now, given all of that, there are many successes historically in epidemiology. And I'm going to discuss the three key ones right now. So the, the first one that should come to mind is the success by the epidemiologic community when it comes to tobacco. It was epidemiologists who were the leaders on this. When we talk about the Hill criteria, that was led by epi an epidemiologist. Collectively, epidemiology studies contributed the most to the level of, to the evidence behind the finding that tobacco is the single greatest cause of, of neoplasms. It was also true that epidemiologists at the time were the ones applying relentless pressure 
on the tobacco industry to change the environments. And they were also actively engaged with government officials at the time. Some of them were government officials to essentially go and pursue the tobacco industry. Another good example of epidemiology success is in reproductive health. Uh, it was through epidemiologic studies that findings were derived that were then provided objective public health basis for the 1973 Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade. And um, specifically the studies provided evidence to support the risks uh, involved of, of, of um, late um, termination of children as well as uh, failure to allow for that and how it could have a negative impact in terms of women seeking terminations in a in uh, through non non healthcare systems and the risks involved therein. A third example, of course, has to do with HIV. It was epidemiologists who discovered uh, the routes of transmission as well as provided the recommendations for preventing uh, preventing HIV essentially one year before the virus was, was identified by the basic researchers. So these are three of the seminal examples in our history of epidemiology in terms of the successes that epidemiology has had at a public health level. Now, I'm sure you can think of another example, a recent example of use of epidemiology. And I'll give you a hint. It's a four letter word that starts with Z. So I wanna go back to that paper by Gallia. And uh, I mentioned before, he argues for this consequentialism and he defines it more specifically in this paper, which is entitled An Argument for Consequentialist Epidemiology. Specifically, he argues that we are too concerned with the correct approach and the rigor of our methods and we being uh, epidemiologists and instead, he says, we need to focus, or the field should be focused, or centrally focused and concerned with improving health outcomes using our methods as our tools. So he argues for a shift in the emphasis, but not necessarily a re-imagining of the discipline or re-imaging of the discipline. So he provides a few examples, one being uh, showing high school graduation and survival as well as a second showing gun violence in the United States. And for each of these two examples, he provides some evidence that epidemiology can be used and can essentially be engaged in these questions that, or problems that greatly affect us at a public health, at a population level. So he says that consequentialist epidemiology would prioritize the assessments the potential contribution to population health for, of particular interventions to boost high school graduation or implications of changes in our gun laws that emulate those in other countries. And he has a very good point in his paper, which is, again, that the field of epidemiology in general is focused much, much too often on the assessment of risk factor and outcome and the evaluation of the causation of that relationship and not focused enough on understanding how to intervene in those relationships between cause and effect to have a public health impact. So it's not only important to understand why we have gun violence in the United States, for example. He also argues, wouldn't it be better to understand what laws have affected the, the lack of gun violence in other countries so that we can then apply them in this country and then study them? I think also he makes a good point that epidemiologists often hide behind the walls of rigor and methods because it's safe. Instead, it's much more dangerous to enter the public or the political realm, if you will, in trying to implement change. But if there was ever a time 
it is now for epidemiologists to become more involved at a public level and a political level to move agendas forward and to also help with this idea that evidence doesn't matter. There is a huge attack right now in our country on knowledge and truth in data. And this, therefore, is a really good opportunity for epidemiologists to become more outspoken about this. I think it would be helpful to be able to turn on CNN or the nightly news or whatever network that you follow and be able to observe an interview with a leading epidemiologist in our country about a particular problem that's happening today, be it obesity, be it gun violence, be it uh, Zika infections. It doesn't matter, but what we need is people to be more public and more vocal, but also to, to insist on staying within the standards of good data and good study design. Because again, it's all about educating non-epidemiologists, non-science people on these problems, which I do believe epidemiologists have not been doing a very good job of in the recent past, with the exception of, of the, Zika, the Zika problem. So I leave you with this. It's a very controversial topic. Um, the consequential epidemiology paper received a lot of counter papers or counter editorials. I strongly urge you to read those. Think about this for yourself, and that is in your future career, do you want to be someone who's more focused in on the methods and on publishing paper after paper of, you know, showing that this risk factor might cause this outcome? Or would you be more interested in being part of committees and scientific policy making efforts to affect issues at a public health level?